My name is John Clayton. I am the executive director of the Manchester Historic Association and this our Milliard Museum. And we are here today to hear a presentation from Michael Bruno regarding his book, uh, Cruising New Hampshire History. Uh, I don't have a lot of experience in the book business myself, <laughs> but I know full well what Mike is going through with his first book. I'm sure Robert could add some anecdotal evidence about uh, what it's like to be a first time author. Uh, but he has been blessed with remarkable response and success. I first found out about his book uh, when his daughter, who works at the Webster House here in Manchester, uh, mentioned to us that we could get a discount if we bought the book, and a portion of the proceeds would go to the Webster House. So I immediately bought four copies, Thank one for you. each of my staff members and one for my daughter, and I said, put it in the back seat, you'll never know when this is going to come in handy. So what Michael has done is put together a book that other people have approached in different ways but never managed to make co a collective uh, com compilation as he has. For example, when I worked at the Union Leader in New Hampshire Sunday News, every Sunday we would highlight one historical marker around the state and write a little uh, blurb about it. And when I would travel around the state with my photographer, Bob LaPree, that was one of our favorite things to keep an eye out for. But it was very random and haphazard. Nothing as comprehensive as what Michael has been able to do. So I think you will come to appreciate the effort that went into this book. Uh, and since you made the effort to come here today, uh, please know that we receive no city, state, or federal funding here at the Milliard Museum. Uh, we survive on grants and donors and members. So if you want to know more about membership, uh, let me know. And having said that, how many of you are here at the Milliard Museum for the first time? Raise your hand. Okay, you can never say that again. You're here. <laughs> <laughs> and we intend to see you here again. So with that, I would like to introduce author Michael Bruno. Thank you, John. Michael. I don't need it. All right, then okay, you're that's good. even better. I teach teenagers. I yell. <laughs> good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, first, when John mentioned the fact we were just talking about the articles that were in the Union Leader, and I said, guess what? I actually had them cut out every week, and I used them in my research as I was developing this. So thank you very much for, for your hard work. It made my job easier. Piece of the action, not much. So I still have them, and I was very saddened when they stopped producing them, but maybe you got all the markers. I just don't have all the copies. So thank you very much for coming today. Uh, so my, I want to share a little bit. I am a high school teacher, but I don't teach history. I would love to, but I'm scared to. Mainly because kids don't like history. And I started thinking, why do they not like history? Because sometimes they're, they're tested to remember names and dates and places, and it's like math. It's boring. If you're a math teacher, I'm sorry. <laughs> but it is one of those things where you have to find a way to make it interesting. And so what I try to do with my presentations is I'm not, I'm going to throw at, I apologize, a disclaimer, I'm going to throw out some dates and names and places, but I'm hoping to share it with you in a, in a, in a um, medium of storytelling. Because that's how we remember. So this is my book. So I am talking about my book, but my book is about the New Hampshire Historical Marker Program and the markers that are throughout the state. A lot of times I get, uh, I, I visit, I usually do like two a week, and I go to places and someone will ask me about a particular marker. And I, I kindly say if it's not a New Hampshire Historical Marker, I didn't research it because this presentation lists 259 state historical markers, but there's thousands of markers throughout the state that are owned by local historical societies, uh, some old monuments that are concrete, I mean, uh, granite, and just it's just be overwhelming. I would still be writing, and it would be 2,000 pages, and no one would read 2,000 pages. Here we go. So if there's a takeaway that I can share with you, if you don't remember all the names, you don't remember all the places and the dates, I hope that you will take away these three things. And the first one is stop to read the markers. Because we all live very busy lives. We travel from point A to point B in the most time efficient means possible. And we're driving down the road and we'll see that flash of green. And we do one of those quickly and wonder, what was that? Oh, it was a marker. Next time I go by here, I'm going to stop and read it. Now, last summer, John would appreciate this, I was uh, approached by the New Hampshire Union leader. And a correspondent said, I'd like, to, I'd like to interview you and do a story about the book. 
And I'm like, great, this is awesome opportunity for me to get some exposure. And he came up to Lancaster, we spent about two hours together. I feel like John and I, John the correspondent, bonded very well. And I mean, like, he was like a friend by the time we are done. So I said, John, I'd like to give you a copy of my book. So I signed it and gave him a copy. He goes, thank you so much. I really appreciate this. Because I'm always running late to my appointments to go to all these different stories, and I'm always running late. And now I have a book. I'll have it next to me in the seat. And then when I get home, I can look it up and see what it was that I missed. <laughs> now, remember, I said, we were bonding. I consider John a friend, so I can say whatever I want. I said, John, why don't you just leave earlier? <laughs> I don't think he did. But the point is, it was, even though it was all for fun, it was one of those things because that's how our lives are. We see the markers. We don't necessarily always go on adventures on doing the Sunday rides to go out and visit the markers. But you're going to get more of the experience. I love my book. But the book is an, an enhancement or an enrichment as you're standing there at the marker. It'll help you understand it more and appreciate when you're on site. Which leads me to the second point. My second point is learn the backstory. The marker is limited to 12 to 14 lines of text. And each line is limited to 45 spaces of a significant historical event. Now you look at these grand buildings where they held in world history, in the cotton industry, in linen, and you go down there to the National Guard Armory and look at the Amoscade Mill sign, it's limited to 12 to 14 lines of text. There is more cut out than what's on there that is significant. So think about it as like a newspaper headline. What you're reading is a small version. And what I try to capture in the book is to learn the backstory. In my in my journeys, because I have visited all 259, but I published May 15, 2018. Not unlike technology, I was outdated practically the time that I published. Because less than a month later, marker 256 was installed. <laughs> and then I proposed a marker that was installed July 31st. So less than two months after I published, I'm already two markers behind. No, I'm not writing a second edition. It's already too big. Oh, but I have this website, and you would always, I will put all the stuff there for you. But the, my point being is, is the, the research, as I visited all the markers, I have to tell you that I did not have that wow factor every time I saw a marker. I can tell you there was at least two occasions I read the marker and went, why is that a marker? <laughs> now, but I will also say, once I learned the backstory, I appreciated why that was installed as a New Hampshire historical marker. Because the text didn't give me the full appreciation of why that was a marker in the first place. So understand that there's the backstory is, takes you from, that's interesting, to wow. And I, will, I honestly believe that all 259 installed markers have that level of like, that is very worthy of being a New Hampshire historical marker. Those are the two takeaways that I had in mind when I came up with the idea of this book. It was my wife's idea of the book, but it was my idea to come up with those two takeaways. It wasn't until we were actually traveling around the state and I was in the Monadnock region. Does anyone here like grew up there or lived in the Monadnock region? It's probably the part of the state I know the least about, but it's beautiful. And I'm driving through there and I realize I need to appreciate the points between the markers. And it was, as I was focused on going from green marker to green marker, I stopped paying attention to the things that I saw along the way. Fortunately enough, I caught on and like, okay, pay attention to everything, even if it means more days of traveling. Appreciate the things that are not on markers. And I found that even though there's 259 markers, there's thousands of things out there worthy of stopping and visiting and viewing. We are very fortunate to live in a state that is small where we can travel throughout the whole state in possibly a day and see so much stuff that goes back to pre-revolutionary war. So I think that we are very blessed as a state to have all these because not all states have markers. So where did this begin with me? It was 1975, I was 10 years old, and my father worked for a company which I think was right down along here somewhere and they stocked, the, uh, stocked shelves of mom and pop stores. And if it was a mom and pop store, he 
probably was the one putting the stuff on the shelves, and he would travel throughout the whole state of New Hampshire. And I would go with him to work in the summertime when I had the opportunity. I didn't go out all the time because, you know, there was those days where the World Series of Wiffle Ball was happening in my backyard and I was Carl Yastrzemski. I had to be there. <laughs> so I didn't go all the time. But when I did go, I really did appreciate the, the passion and the knowledge that my father was able to share with me. Then it goes around high school time. I don't have a car like most kids today have. I think I graduated, I grew up in Tilton. I went to Winnesquam. I think in my graduating class of 98 kids, I think three students had cars. The rest were teachers. Now I think it's the other way around. Mm -hmm. But we had motorcycles. And my friends and I would like to ride our motorcycles. And we'd go down Route 3A. I remember we would go down this way and skip the toll and drive down to Hudson or go up to uh, Lebanon and Enfield. And as we traveled around, I'd see a marker. And I'd pull over and look at it. My friends blasted by. Then I'd read the marker, start back up and catch up to them. And they'd like, hey, where were you? I'm like, I stopped to read a marker. And they're like, oh, OK. They had no interest. But that's OK. It was something that I was interested in. If I saw it, I'd stop. Now, after high school, I went to college. After college, I was in the workforce for a little bit. And then I joined the Army. And I, I, I retired in 2009. And I finally got a chance to move back to New Hampshire, which is what I wanted to do. My wife, a career educator, she got a job in the North Country, and then I got a job teaching in the North Country. So guess where we live? We live in the North Country. And she decides to get her motorcycle license. And she gets her license, she does the little parking lot two-day course, and then when we go out riding at the Great North Woods in the White Mountains region, she decides it's like, it's time to practice left turns. I'm like, can't we just ride? But we would go out and practice, or she would practice. And then I remember one day in particular, we probably hit seven to ten markers just riding on some nice roads. That evening when we're sitting down talking, we started talking about the markers. Because she was nicer than my friends in my high school. She actually stopped and read them with me. And we were talking about the markers and realized, how do you find them? And I said, I just see them and I just pull over. She said, well, it's got to be a resource. And I will tell you, I was a library trustee at the time, so I went to my director. I said, is there a book on this? And she goes, well, let's find out. So she got on WorldCat or one of the databases. There was no book. She did have a pamphlet, which I don't have, but I do have one that a classmate of mine called me this morning before I left my home in Bethlehem. He says, my aunt just dropped off three boxes of junk, and I'm going through it, and guess what I found? Do you want it? And it's 1974. It was the State's Historical Marker book. So, I've had this for less than two hours. <laughs> I picked it up this morning. But as you can see, I mean, it's, it's basically a little bit of information from all the markers from 1974, and it's a little artist sketch. This is what the state had. What we had at my, state, at my town library was the last one we believe was published was in 1984 or 1986, and the state stopped publishing these. What they did was, in the 2000s, they went to a a website and the state does have a website on the historical marker program you can google New Hampshire historical markers brings you up to historical resources and you can click on historical mar markers when you get there back in 2014 and 15 you had two PDF files one of them listing the markers from number 0001 in Pittsburgh to whichever one was most recently published that data that they had was two years out of date. The other file was all markers from Antrim through Wolfboro alphabetical, which is nice if you know you're going to be in a certain town that starts with the letter F and you're going to be in Fremont, you can find five markers. But if you're driving, it wasn't something that was user friendly. They have since gotten better, and I'll share some of that with you along the way. But that's how it all started with me. As I told you, 1975. I traveled with my dad, and one summer, a little, let me back it up just a little bit. Back when I was traveling with my dad, my family doctor actually lived across the street from me. And then, much like a lot of other small communities, the, he had his practice in his house. I was doing a presentation three weeks ago, and a lady goes, was that Dr. Frank? I'm like, yes, how do you know? She had the same doctor. 
So he had his practice in his house, he lived across the street from me. Dr. Frank had asked my parents if it was okay if I had a day off from school, because he was taking his son down to the state house because President Gerald Ford was giving a speech on the steps of the state capitol. I was really excited because I'm going to get a chance to see the President of the United States. Actually, it was because I was getting a day off from school. But I was still excited to see the President. I didn't get to rub elbows, he was pretty far away, but hey, I still saw Gerald Ford. That summer, riding with my dad, this, this marker here, this is Interstate 89, that's 3A. This is where Interstate 89 meets at Bow Junction for pony car dealerships. And there's a little park and ride. And we stopped there, probably had lunch, and I got up and read this marker. Now, I'm 10 years old and I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, wow, this is really cool. Our president was here. And at the time, I was really into presidents, so I knew he was the seventh president. And I just saw the 38th president of the United States this past school year. And I didn't realize that we had two presidents come to New Hampshire. It didn't take me until I was long older to realize they come every four years, like the other half. <laughs> but remember, as a 10-year-old, I'm reading this marker. And this is the part you can read this and say, this is interesting facts about Andrew Jackson's visit. It's the backstory that takes that story and it actually enhances it and makes it more interesting. Andrew Jackson was a Tennessean. He was a very populous president. He was considered one of the fathers of the Democratic Party. He was on a New England tour. He had already finished his visits to Connecticut, Rhode Island, and Massachusetts, and he was heading north to Concord, most likely on the Londonderry Turnpike Road that runs from Boston to Concord along the Merrimack River, probably right through here. And you think, back in the day, it was stage. So he was on a stagecoach. Every time they had to stop and water the horses, you know, get the blood flowing back in the left, he'd stop in a little a spot and maybe meet the locals and then move on to the next stop. Very intimate, probably. Uh, not too big of fanfare until he got here. When he arrived here in Bow, he was actually being escorted by, or his host for this event was a person who was the speaker of the New Hampshire State Legislature, also known as Young Hickory. But we don't know him as Young Hickory, we know him as the 40, 14th President of the United States, Franklin Pierce. Franklin Pierce was hosting Andrew Jackson. And he was wanting to make sure that the president was very comfortable, he was enjoying himself, and everything was going well. He gets here and it's like a circus-like environment. There's bands playing, marching band music, there's people on horses showing their skills of riding, <coughs> people celebrating, and the president is tired. So they go to the sleeping tents and it's still loud. So Franklin Pierce goes out there to basically pull the plug on the party. But Andrew Jackson says not to, because he understands why the people are there. They're there because the President of the United States is here, and let them celebrate. So the celebration continued, they got their rest, and on the morning of June 29, 1833, the cavalcade, and they all marched to, from this point, or near this point, to the State House Capitol, where President Andrew Jackson was officially welcomed in the state of New Hampshire. Now if you'll notice here, it says, this marked the conclusion of a triumphal New England tour, which it was. However, he was actually scheduled to go to Maine, but he was so tired, he's like, yeah, I don't need to go to Maine. Let's just go back to D.C. So he skipped out on the state of Maine. I think he ended on a good note ending here. And if you're from Maine, I apologize for that, but I still believe he ended on a good note ending here in New Hampshire. The marker program was established in 1955. The state legislature had, um, is a collaboration between, at the time, the, the Division of Public Works, which is now DOT, Department of Transportation, and the Division of Historical Resources. Those two departments in our state government manage this program to this day. It took three <coughs> years for the first four markers to be installed, with marker number one being installed in Pittsburgh. Has anyone here been to Pittsburgh? Good, that's a good number of folks. I did a presentation in Portsmouth, and a person said to me, I hope you appreciate this, she goes, isn't that where they have the balloon festival? I said, uh, that's Pittsfield. It's just up the road. <laughs> but people don't realize how far Pittsburgh is if they've never been there. It's 100 miles for me to get here today. It's another hour and a half for me from my house in Bethlehem to Pittsburgh. It's it used there. to be a separate country. 
Well, if you hold on, I will share that with you. So that's what this marker here is about. In 1832, the land between Indian Stream and Hall Stream had a disputed boundary between the United States and Canada. The settlers between those two streams did not know whether they were in, on American soil or Canadian soil. And being the hard scrabble folks that they are, decided to do something about it. They drafted their own constitution on Hall Road in the Meeting House and became an independent nation, the Re independent nation of Republic of Indian Stream. Now, they had their own set of laws. They, if you were a voting age male, you were part of the legislative body. In essence, you were there part of the Congress or Parliament, whichever form of government they had at the time. They don't know what they called it, but it's basically their legislative council. If you owned a firearm, which you think in 1800s in Pittsburgh, everyone owned a firearm, you were part of the Republic's militia. So as I said, they had their own set of laws, they were self-governing. Canada looked at them and said, oh, let the kids play, they don't know better. And they didn't really pay much of attention. Unlike New Hampshire, the government of New Hampshire was peeved by this. The governor would send up the New Hampshire militia and apprehend members of the Republic's council and bring them back and try them. Now, I don't know what they were being tried for, but they were, being, they were trying to capture them. And they would also send up the county sheriff to capture these guys. Each year, the Republic would review the Constitution and make changes that they found necessary. But there was a lot of pressure of always worrying whether someone's going to come up here and capture you. So in 1836, they, ceded, they uh, disbanded as a Republic and ceded to the state of New Hampshire. Now, this is in 1836. It was another six years before they even found out they were in the United States. Because it was 1842 when they actually the, the, the international boundary was, was uh, determined. And Daniel Webster was actually part of the uh, delegation that helped determine that. Fort number four in Charleston is along the Connecticut River. And at the, its time in 1744, it was considered the most northwestern white English settlement uh, along the Connecticut River Valley. So the forts were numbered one through four as they went north up the Connecticut River. Fort number three was down in Dumberson, Massachusetts, which was like 30 to 40 miles south. And you think how beautiful it would be up there, all that beautiful woods. But they were surrounded by Abnaki Indians who allied with the French. So they're already in hostile territory. Let's add to that. All the land on the west side of the Connecticut River was claimed by the colony of New York. So they really didn't have good neighbors. And there was 31 men that started the settlement there. And they were, you know, they were doing well. There was a siege that happened. Three days, the French and Indian attacked the fort. But the 31 men garrison were able to hold off the siege and maintain control. And there was never another attack on, on fort number four. To this day, it is a, a living museum. You can go there in the summer. People are dressed in uh, era clothes, and they will cook food, and they'll show you what life was like in the 1700s. There was no internet then. <laughs> in Amherst, not far from here, and this one I have to say, I did not know a whole lot about this. Now I'm driving around the North Woods area and White Mountains, and I get down on Route 101, and I'm panicking, like, oh my gosh, there's cars everywhere, there's lights, and there's stores, and it was like information overload, but there was Dunkin' Donuts, so I was able to calm down, and I was okay. <laughs> But if you look on this marker right here, there's very limited text. There's about three sentences worth of information about a man named Horace Greeley. And the marker will give you some information, but there's nothing about there that says, wow, that is fantastic. So I, I like to share the backstory on Horace Greeley. He lived not far from this marker off of 101 in Amherst. He lived with his parents, and they were farmers, and they were very poor. But the neighbors recognized how smart young Horace was and they were willing to pay the tuition for a Horace to attend Phillips Exeter Academy, which was known as the most prestigious school of its time. And even to this day, it's considered one of the most prestigious private, college, uh, private high schools in New Hampshire. But the parents had too much pride, and they were humbled by the offer, but they declined. Horace did not attend Phillips Exeter <coughs> Academy. The parents continued with their debt, and ultimately, they had to move to West Poultney, Vermont, to reestablish themselves. While they were there, at the age of 15, Horace started his trade as a printer's apprentice to learn the trade of printmaking. And he did that for four years in Vermont. On his fifth year, he moved to Pennsylvania, got into the trade. And then he moved to New York City, moved to the Big Apple. 
And he started a little paper. It was about current topics and issues. And some of you may have heard of it. It's called The New Yorker. But if you read about The New Yorker, just do a quick Google search. They do not credit Horace Greeley as the founder of the paper. And that's because in his efforts, it was not successful. He abandoned that paper and moved on and, and started and founded what's now known as the New York Herald Tribune. So the New York Tribune was, he, he founded that paper. And in its day, it was the most widely circulated paper in the United States. So he was the founder and editor of the largest form of media in our country. Good rags to riches story. But I'm sure he's a guy that with his intellect, he felt like he needed a little bit more challenge. And he's in a different social circle than he did have when he was living in Amherst, New Hampshire. His, he had some folks approach him and said, would you be interested in serving in Congress? Because the 6th District of Manhattan, the congressman, congressman from the 6th District of Manhattan was being ousted for fraud. So they had this open seat. And they asked if Horace would be interested. Mr. Greeley would serve that term, the remainder of that term, and he took the offer. Left the newspaper and went to Washington, D.C. Now, I want you to put things in perspective. Think about the man in the 1800s who's in charge of the largest form of media in the country. And think about his management style. He's probably not what you call a collaborator. He's probably a person that this is what you do, you do it, and it gets done, if you want a job. And he moves to Washington, D.C. And he's also the newest member of Congress. So think about how effective he probably was in bonding and creating relationships. He was actually very unsuccessful. He, he had created, he had sponsored no bills, and he didn't build any alliances. Now, the, the term ended and he went back to the newspaper because he wanted to serve in Congress longer, but no one would nominate him for the party's ticket. So he's okay, I guess I'll go back to my newspaper. And he did. But here's a disclosure. Mr. Greeley served the remainder of that term, which was only 90 days. He didn't get an opportunity to get much done. But there's people that serve now that are there for 20, 30 years, and they still don't get anything done. <laughs> but he still had the itch for politics. And while he was at the paper, he decided he was a supporter of the current administration. But during that administration, he decided he was against the administration and chose to run against the incumbent president. So he actually was nominated for the Liberal Republican Party for president of the United States. And he ran against the incumbent president. That incumbent was Ulysses S. Grant. So Horace Greeley is running against President Grant, and he was losing in a landslide. A couple weeks before the election, his wife passed away. So now he's distraught at the loss of his wife, and he also knows he is so... He is so far out of the race that he's losing this election that he has a mental breakdown and he's committed to a mental hospital and dies before the election. Uh -huh. So he went from rags to riches to a very sad ending. Um, but he was born locally. And this is one of the ones I really enjoy speaking of is the William and Mary Raids. And this marker number four is in Newcastle. It is on the very point, the northeast point of Portsmouth at the mouth of the Piscataqua River. It's now known as Fort Constitution. And I love telling this story because we all know of the, the, the Paul Revere's famous ride. We've all learned it in school. Paul Revere, the one if by land, two if by sea, riding his horse up the Lexington and Concord Road to warn the patriots that the British are coming. But what I don't think a lot of people realize is that was in April of 1775. He did the, a very similar ride four months earlier. He went from Boston to Portsmouth, New Hampshire on the Boston Post Road. Because the rumor was, the French and Indian War is just about over, and the British are gonna come and shut down Fort William and Mary. So they saw an opportunity. So Paul Revere Road told the colonists in Portsmouth, it's true, the rumor's true, the British Navy is coming, they're gonna shut down Fort William and Mary. So up to 400 men were gathered up, they marched to the fort, and they invaded the fort. They went in there and they took light cannons, they took gunpowder. They were so successful on their raid, on December 14th, they did it again the next day. 
<laughs> so they then went back on December 15th and raided the fort again. Now, it sounds like a lot of acts of courage and valor, but the truth is the British manned the fort with Captain Cochrane and five men. It was like 400 to 6. And I will say that in my opinion, I don't think Captain Cochran and his men held the door open for him and helped him carry the barrels of gunpowder, but there was no resistance. They wanted to go back for a third day because, hey, they're doing so well, but the British showed up on the 16th. In total, they took 97 barrels of gunpowder and 16 light cannons, cashed them throughout New Hampshire Colony and Durham and Exeter and Portsmouth. And they used that same gunpowder and cannons against the British at the Battle of Bunker Hill six months later in June of 75. So I think it's kind of neat that they stole it all from them and then used it against them. And that is also considered the first overt act against the British armed forces. And it wasn't Lexington and Concord where the first shot was fired. This was the first overt act. Lexington and Concord had better public relations. <laughs> Probably did. So currently the marker program has 259 markers throughout the state. And as if you'll notice, they're generally equally distributed with the exception of the Great North Woods at 15. It's also the least populated and the last area settled. Merrimack Valley region has more than their share of 66, but if you think about it, this is the spine of our state, or the, the bloodline of our state, with Manchester and Concord and all the things along the Merrimack River. And then you also have Concord here, it has a whopping 13 markers in the city alone. Now, they're not all within walking distance, I'll tell you that. If you're thinking about putting on your walking shoes and going to visit 13 markers, you could, but it'll be an all-day adventure. You can get a whole bunch of them just on North Main Street and South Main Street, but the most northern one is uh, New Hampshire Technical Institute, has one for the Pennacook Tribe near the athletic field. The one furthest east is at the National Guard headquarters on Loudoun Road, and it's for the Civil War mustering camp. Furthest west is Mary Baker Eddy's house, on Pleasant Street, which is now, I think it was the Oddfellows home, and the one further south is the uh, Hurricane of 1938 Turkey Pond on Route 13 on the road to Dunbarton. But the rest of them look like they're all generally the uh, same amount, except if you look at this one, it looks like they have the same amount as everyone else, but the Seacoast region is the smallest region, and they have more markers per ge uh, geographic region than the other states do. But it makes sense. It is the birthplace of our state. And this here is the marker that I had installed. I proposed and submitted. It was installed July 31st. And it's at the entrance to the Rocks Estate in Bethlehem. I like to talk about what I consider unique markers. And I don't call them my favorites because I don't have one. Well, actually, the Francis Buston League one is my favorite, but that's bias. <laughs> Um, but I like to choose some from each of the regions, and I want to share a quick little story about each one and why I chose it. And for the Great North Woods region, I chose Metallic. And this is up in Stewartstown. And the story about this, this is where I share about the, where does the line of fact and lore blend? And if you read a book called Above the Notches, where Mike Dickerman, who lives up in Littleton, is, uh, he's written a number of books. Uh, this is one of his books. Uh, there's a segment in there about Metallic. Metallic was known, it was an Abnaki Indian of the Mount Galloway tribe, it's considered to be the last one. He lived in that community. He was a hunter and a trapper and fisherman. It says he was blinded up there, he was blinded by accident. So I wonder what the accident is, because once you hear all the stories, there's a lot of opportunities for accident. But it is said that he lived to the ripe old age of 120. And so some of the stories that you can read about him, again, it's the, the lore part that people are tend to remember more than the facts is Metallica is known to have killed a moose with nothing more than a knife and bravery. I'd like to have seen that. Maybe that's where he got the accident with the eye. The other story that I want to share with you about Metallica is his wife, Molly Molasses, lived with her family. Yes, that's her name. <laughs> she lived over on Sebago Lake in Maine. So they had like a distant relationship. So there was no phone calls or anything. So he'd have to walk from Stewart's down to Sebago Lake to visit her. And he'd stay for a few months and then he'd come back home. He was in his 80s, so he's still relatively young. Molly was half his age, she was in her 40s. And they were trekking back in the, the time of like late winter, early spring, and they were leaving the Sebago Lake area, heading back to New Hampshire. And along the way, she died. 
but he was in no condition to be able to carry her through the woods and the snow, and he knew if he left her there, she'd be ravished by animals. So he had to do something to, to protect her so he could get her back in the spring. So the lore is that he built a, spot, a pyre of wood and smoked her remains to preserve them so he could go back in the spring and retrieve her. I don't know if that's true, but it makes for a great story, right? Now, if you go to this marker, there's a dirt road there called Creampoke Road. And if you go down there two miles, the cemetery is just down there. And the cemetery is not, is probably not even twice the size of this room. And you can find his grave site. It's in the back. And it's very obvious because it's decorated. When I was there, there was a walking stick with a hawk feather. There was stones where people put some coins, some little mementos, and someone actually left a beer. <laughs> it wasn't drank, but it was probably pretty warm. So I don't know if anyone ever drank it. But they still leave mementos for metallic. For the White Mountains region, I chose Lincoln. This is in front of the Indian Head Resort in North Lincoln. And I don't have to say much more other than the fact that the Betty and Barney Hill incident of 1961, and it was an alien abduction. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. get much more unique than that. Yeah. When I had an opportunity last fall to uh, spend time with Sean McDonald for on New Hampshire Chronicle, I asked him, where do you want to go? He goes, can we start at the Betty Bar Barney Hill sign? I'm like, sure. So we went there, and we, we talked about this, and then we did some others, and we ended up in Bethlehem, and he got to see the Glessner sign. But he was intrigued by this. So it is a fascinating story, and I like to think that the, the abduction that happened, or the acclaimed abduction, I did do a uh, segment on New Hampshire One, this is posted on there, but it was a grad student from uh, a film school in Toronto, and we listened to the audio tapes of the hypnosis events that uh, Barney went through. And I'm not an expert, but it was hard not to believe that he wasn't actually speaking what he was seeing in, in hypnosis. So it was very moving. Now, I wasn't even born when this happened, but I remember when the movie came out. And I remember my dad and I going down to Lake Winnesquam with binoculars, looking at the sky. Oh, something's moved. That's a UFO. You know, everything we saw was a UFO. I think this story of the abduction made aliens what Jaws did to sharks. For the seacoast region, I chose Bound Rock because I didn't know much about it, and it was actually kind of hard to find. And this is one of the markers that is not on a state highway. It's in a residential area. And the, what had happened was the Massachusetts Bay Colony, when there was two grants that King James had signed, they conflicted on the boundary between what is now known as Hampton, or Seabrook, and Salisbury, Massachusetts. So everyone that lived in this stretch of about a mile were actually charged and taxed in both New Hampshire and Massachusetts. And if you failed to pay the tax, you were arrested and brought to court. So it obviously caused a problem. The Massachusetts Bay Colony, what they ended up doing was hiring Captain Shapley, who was a surveyor, and he actually started surveying the bottom line between uh, Massachusetts and New Hampshire. So he found this rock on the Hampton River, and he marked it. In 1647, there's a mark there for HB, Hampton Bound. SH was the Shapley's trademark, and that was the mark, the easterly marker point of New Hampshire and Massachusetts. It had continued west to what is called the Shapley Line. But I told you it was along the Hampton River. Over the next hundreds of, about 300 years, the river shifted two miles north. And the rock was buried for a couple hundred years. And it wasn't until 1937 an excavator was digging, hit this rock, and he probably came out to look at it and saw these markings on there, like, ooh, better not touch that. And they found out that is the original uh, boundary between <coughs> Massachusetts and New Hampshire. And it's, it's similar to the Endicott Rock. It's got a, state, uh, a, a concrete uh, box around it with steel bars. So the rock is protected, but they don't mow the grass. Someone really needs to mow that grass. <laughs> so down in the Monadnock region, I chose Levi Woodbury. And the reason being is he was a small town lawyer. Yet he was the only person from New Hampshire and probably I don't know how many other people in this country that has this notoriety, where he served in all three branches of the state government and all three branches of the federal government. He was a state legislator, governor, and judge here in the state of New Hampshire. He went on to be a U.S. Senator, U.S. Secretary of War, 
U.S. Secretary of Treasury, and a Supreme Court Justice. And he's from the small town of Francistown. And he's the only one that has that notoriety. I'm going to pick on these two right now. If everyone can see them, I'm going to talk about these together. And does anyone see a conflict? They both claim the same thing. Last soldier. Mm -hmm. They both claim to have the last soldier of the revolution. So rather than these two towns of Antrim and Newport duking it out, if you read about the stories and you understand a little bit more, they make sense. Both Samuel Dowling, who lived in Antrim, and Joel McGregor, who lived in Newport, were born out of state. Joel McGregor was born in Connecticut. Samuel Dowling was a young boy living in Massachusetts. Joel McGregor joined, the, uh, he joined and served in the Revolution. He fought in New York City. He was a POW, and he was held captive in a sugar house for, I think, 90 days when he was released. They were released because the British didn't have food to feed them. Released them. He came back to Newport and lived the rest of his life for 70 odd years. He was a blacksmith and died. But he, 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 uh, <coughs> he lived his whole life after the war in New Hampshire. Samuel Downing in Antrim was a 10 year old boy down in Massachusetts. A gentleman comes up and says, you want a job? And he goes, sure. So he went with this guy and moved to New Hampshire. He didn't tell his parents, by the way. Not for two more years. He went back when he was 12 and said, parents, I'm still, I'm good. They thought he drowned. But they let him go back. He was working as an apprentice. And at the age of 14, the revolution started. And he wanted to serve. So he went to Hopkinton, to the Continental Army. I don't know they had recruiting offices, but he went to the encampment and wanted to sign up. And they said, you're too young. You can't join. But if you go to Charlestown, the state militia, they'll take you. So he did. And he went to Charleston, joined the state militia, and fought in the Revolutionary War. After the war, he moved back to Antrim. Served, he lived there for a number of years. And, then, and when he got into his senior years, he moved to New York State. And the pension records do show that he was one of the oldest surviving uh, members of the Revolutionary War. And he actually lived longer than Joel McGregor, but he was living in New York. So they're both, I believe in my opinion, worthy of markers, and they both communities should be proud of what they have. And lastly, I want to share a little story here about Concord. As I said, Concord has 13 markers. So I'm driving down from Bethlehem, I'm planning out my day, I'm like, there's 13 in Concord, I'm going to, this is a big marker day for me, I'm going to hit up, I'm going to get 30 markers today. So I'm driving around, and there's one called the Pierce Mance, and it's the house that Franklin Pierce lived in. And there's a museum in there, so I did all my routine in my I always followed, I will share this little sidebar. Every marker I visited, I followed my own rules. Before I did anything, I stopped to read the marker, both sides. Then I took pictures, GPS, and everything else. But I always read the marker. So after visiting the Pierce Mance, I'm taking pictures outside. I'm going to go inside, get some brochures, so I have some research material later. And this kind lady comes up to me, she says, would you be interested in a tour? How long is it? She goes, it's about 20 minutes. Oh. I don't have time for that. I have a busy schedule, I got all these markers to do. You know, I hope you understand. 45 minutes later, <laughs> kidding, I was still there, talking to this lady because her stories were so awesome. I should have just done the tour. But I have to tell you, there was so, it was so much fun to hear the stories that she was able to share. And I'm going to share with you something that I put in my book, and it's a story that she gave me and I have not been able to find in any records. But she told me, and it's, again, it's the whole story telling and how we share our history through stories. I'm going to share what she shared with me. Now, just as a backstory, remember, after the Revolutionary War, we had the, the Constitution. We actually had two conventions. They went back to visit and make changes, talking about centralized government and states' rights. And it's all down in, in, in uh, Philadelphia. When the delegates came back, each state had to sit down and ratify it. And this is what I was told. An interesting story I heard from a volunteer at the Pierce Mans. She informed me that the New Hampshire delegates could not come to an agreement on ratification. On June 21st, after a lengthy debate, delegates departed for a break from the afternoon heat. Some delegates left to visit a local tavern and consumed a great deal of rum and did not return. Those who returned voted to ratify the federal constitution and we became the ninth state in the new union. Now keep in mind that ratification requires a two-thirds vote majority of the 13 original colonies. The ninth state to ratify the federal constitution would be 
that the deciding factor or the deciding delegation in New Hampshire will live with that recognition because of a hot day in Rome. <laughs> but we all know that the water wasn't safe to drink, so they're actually trying to have good hygiene. I don't know if that's true, but it sure makes for a great story. So this is the state website as it appears today. Obviously, it's much nicer than it was back in 2014 and 15, and they do have tabs along the top. And if you click on those tabs, you'll see that region, and you can find they'll have uh, thumbnails of all the markers, but the markers will literally have a number, the name of the marker, and an address. That's it. There's no other information. And I'll tell you why that's frustrating. Marker 256, the first one that's not in that book, is in Boston. And it's called Garish Depot. The state's website lists it as Route 3, Boston. Has anyone been through Boston before? Yes. Yes. That goes from the Merrimack River to Franklin. That's not very good directions. I'm glad I was driving and not walking. But I'm driving through and I see yard sales and it's foliage time and I'm like, where is this dang marker? And I drive all the way down, I go by the State Veterans Cemetery, I still haven't seen it, I'm still heading towards Franklin and I get to the Merrimack County Jail and lo and behold, right past the jail is a marker. Well, there it is. And they had no other address. So I get out, find a safe place to park, read the marker, then I start tagging it. I'm like, if I put this down, for people to find. Merrimack County Jail does not sound very appealing. So I put this across the street from the nursing home. <laughs> so it's right there. If you're looking for it, head towards Franklin. When you see the jail, it's right after the jail. Just don't pick nice up the checkers. <laughs> it's a very nice jail. This is a class of 2018. These are the markers that are not listed in the book, but I do put them on my webpage. And that's Garish Depot. That's right next to the jail. And this is the one that I had submitted. And then these two were down in uh, Danville and Nottingham. If you notice here, there's a little camera guy. So this fall, after the segment on New Hampshire Chronicle, and I was also interviewed for the Boston Globe, I had a call from Mr. Conley, who was a producer for WCVB Boston Chronicle. And he wanted to do a segment. I'm like, this is great. So he goes, I'd love to meet with you. I said, great. He goes, you live up in Bethlehem? I said, yes. He goes, I'm not going up there. <laughs> All right. He goes, can you meet down here? And I said, I can. Now, I hadn't seen these two markers yet, and they happen to be one just north of Route 101 and one's just south of Route 101, near Raymond. So I said, let's meet in Raymond, and then we'll, I already plotted out where the markers would be. I hadn't seen them yet. So the cameraman went ahead, and as I was driving up to Nottingham, he actually filmed me visiting the marker for the first time, going through my routine. And it was a lot of fun spending time. It was a really cold day, though. But we had fun, and those are the four markers of 2018. The class of 2019 has two markers right now that the dates haven't been set for installation. The first one is in Hanover, and it is for the gentleman who created the basic computer language. And I apologize, I don't know his name. I did ask somebody uh, who was a, a newspaper article writer in the uh, Connecticut River Valley to let me know when the date has been set, so I can go and see that. And the other one's going to be in Hollis, and it's for the first English settlers in that area. And those are the only two that I know of as of now that are being installed in 2019. But I did do a presentation in Dover, and a gentleman asked about, and you'll see later on, how to uh, propose a marker. Once he found out, next thing I know, he's sending me the draft text, and he said, I want to do one on uh, Senator Joseph Hale, Senator John Hale Parker, John Parker Hale. And his statue is on the state uh, capitol. And he's from the Dover area. And he's actually putting in a proposal for that right now. It's pretty fascinating. So Manchester has their own three. These two I put together because one's in English and one's in French. I cannot translate that for you unless I read this. Um, but obviously, the city of Manchester is rich in history with Manscaped Mills here. And, and it was actually. Uh, the center of the world where once they, they got the, the technology and stole the information from how England did it, we surpassed everything that could be done by the English and we became the, tr the center of the universe in Lenin. And it all started here in these buildings. Which is, and as I was walking down the hallway looking down that long tube, 
I'm like, I gotta go, Mr. Clayton, I'm gonna be back here. And then market number two, because of the Amiskade Mills, the large influx of French Canadian immigrants that came there weren't able to get loans. So I believe it was the local church, St. Mary's, their, um, the pastor actually started a credit union where the members would put in dividends and people were borrowing from other members in the first credit union in our country. And this one I really enjoyed. And that's Stark Park, which is just down the road, um, a couple miles, I think. But it's actually the property, and I didn't know it until I visited, it was the actual property where the Starks lived. And it was handed down from the parents, and John Stark bought the property from his brothers that they had some lots. It was a 30-acre plot, and General Stark is buried there with his family. And during the Battle of Bennington, when soldiers were ill, they would be shipped back here, and Mrs. Stark tended to them. Very fascinating story. So if you travel from this building, there is a, there's an opportunity to hit up 67 markers. That's a lot of driving. But it isn't hard to see that if you just stay right along Route 3, or you know, I always like to talk about Fremont, they literally have five in like four miles. Yeah, I did a happy dance when I was out there. It's like <laughs> boom, 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 boom. I'm on the same road. There's another marker. There's another marker. And you're right in the hub of it. Anywhere between Concord and Manchester is the center of the markers. And you can do a great deal of um, uh, exploring just from here. The reason I bring this up is where I live, we don't have this condensation of markers. But I'm friends with our postmaster in our town and our wife, where he, him and I are both veterans. Our wives are friends. And, and last fall during foliage, we decided to go for a motorcycle ride. And we don't ride on the interstates. We just go through um, state roads. And we're leaving the town of Bethlehem. We're going through Franconia Village. Down Franco we're going to go down through Franconia Notch. We're going to get to Lincoln. And we're going to go east on the Kank. Go do Pinkham Notch, Crawford Notch. Come back Bear Notch. Back on the Kank. Come back home. I was literally at the basin. And it dawned on me. <clears throat> it's the Highland Games. I am not getting off at exit 32 in Lincoln. So. We pulled over at the flume, he goes, what's up? I'm like, we can't go. There's, it's the Highland Games. You just don't go there. So he's like, what do you want to do? I said, well, why don't we take 112 and we'll head west. We'll go over by uh, Lost River. We'll go into Bath and Haverhill. We'll go up the Moose Lock Highway to Warren. There's a giant rocket ship. And they have great ice cream. And we did that. We're sitting there having ice cream. And I turned to Brian and I said, do you realize we just passed 10 markers? He literally put his spoon down, he looks at me and he goes, I did not know that, but I'm not surprised that you do. <laughs> but it, we don't have to plan it to have a day's visit of St. Marcus. So as I told you, my third point, and that is appreciating all the things between the markers. This is Madame Sherry's forest yep. down in West Chesterfield, and that is an arching stairway that used to go to a French chateau. If you know the story of Madame Sherry, she was born in Paris, she was a costume designer and lived down in New York City. So she hung out with some socialite friends that were probably high up in the social circles and this was her summer home. And it was, and I've heard this on a number of places, people have verified this, that she would drive around in her Packard in nothing more than a coat and a hat <laughs> and nothing else. But when you had her money, you can do whatever you want. Is it, you heard that story too? Yes. Yes. <laughs> I'm sure that was interesting when you had to pull over and get gas. Um, but the house, after the crash of the stock market in 1929, she didn't come back for almost 30 years. And when she came back, the house was in disrepair, vandalized, and she was so heartbreaking in this condition, she cried and never returned. And the house finally burnt down in the early 60s. And I believe this was like a guest house. But this haunting staircase is, is a lot of people go there just for the pictures. This here is in Winchester, and that's at the Sweetwater Distillery. My, Kristen and I, my wife, were driving through this cute little village, and I see this sign, and I'm like, let's go. So we pull in, it's Kristen and myself and the owner. That's it. He puts out his sample of distiller spirits that he distills. He's talking about them. Then he gives me a tour of the facility. We start chatting. In our conversation, he knows I'm a veteran. Because then you know who Leonard Wood is. Anyone here an Army veteran? Thank you for your service. So keep in mind, he's asking me who Leonard Wood is, and all I can think of is Fort Leonard Wood, we know it as Fort Lost in the Woods. 
And that's all I know. And then he shares with me, well, you know, he was born in this building. And I felt actually very embarrassed at the fact that I didn't know the history of Leonard Wood. So I read on it. And here, and all they have is this plaque. And here is the backstory in a quick 15 seconds. Leonard Wood was born in this building, went on to Harvard Medical College, got his medical degree. He earned the Medal of Honor in the last Battle of Geronimo. He was a commander for Teddy Roosevelt's Rough Riders. He was a Secretary of War, and he was also the uh, presidential doctor for doc uh, President Garfield, and he was the Governor General, who was basically the ruler of Cuba and the Philippines when we occupied both countries. And he was born in that building, and I had no idea. I was actually embarrassed that I didn't. Now I'm happy to know that I do know it, and I hope someday someone puts in a marker there. And as I was leaving Winchester on my way to Fitzwilliam getting a marker, remember I'm thinking, I'm thinking about marker to marker, and I pass this big brown sign with yellow letters. I'm stopping to have a bite to eat in, the, in Fitzwilliam, and there's only one place to stop in Fitzwilliam. There's no other businesses there. <laughs> and I asked the lady, I said, is there anything around here that's worth seeing? She said, oh, you should go to the Botanical Park. I said, Where, where's that? And she gave me directions, and I'm like, I just passed it. How did I miss that? So we turned around, and this is in July, and it was probably about 80 degrees out. We go there, it's about 8 degrees, 10 degrees cooler. There's maybe four cars in the whole parking lot. We walk in, and the rhododendrons are in bloom. Mm -hmm. It was the first time in my life I ever looked at rhododendrons like this. They're trees. It is, in my opinion, this is New Hampshire's best kept secret, that we should not keep a secret. Beautiful. Some other places along the way, this is Stark Village. This vantage point and the, the uh, vantage point looking uh, over Shakur Lake at Mount Shakur are both can, uh, believed to be the most photographed spots in the state since the fall of the old man. I don't know which one it is, but they're both beautiful. This here is a bridge in, uh, near St. Gaudens Park over near Plainfield in Cornish. And there's no marker for this bridge, but not only is it arched, it's curved, and there's no mortar. It's just over the blow me down stream. And I'm looking at it, this is a beautiful bridge, so I happen to take a picture of it. And then lastly, this one down here is in Portsmouth. This is the uh, Wentworth Coolidge Mansion on Little Harbor Road. Beautiful. And this is where first colonial governor Benning Wentworth lived. And if you're a fan of Fritz Weatherby, he's always talking about his friend Benning Wentworth. This was where he lived. He must have had a big boat if he had that anchor. But during the time of Benning Wentworth, the colonial seat of government for New Hampshire was Portsmouth. And he didn't like to go to his office to do his work. He liked to work from home. I think he was our first telecommuter. <laughs> if you're interested in providing or putting in a marker, if you have an interest in the marker program, it's very simple. There's no cost to you as a sponsor to do one. Any municipality, agency, organization, or individual, all it has to do is relate to a significant person, place, or event in our state's history. Very open-ended. Very open-ended. I will tell you they do like diversity in their markers. I believe that my marker went through the process very quick for a number of reasons. One, I was on the phone with them all the time. But I also was giving them information. I do believe that was helpful. Second, I was very thorough in my research in that I provided them all the data. And third, it was about a 20th century woman, and that is exactly what she told me, the person at the state, she was, it's so nice to have a, a marker about a 20th century woman. We typically get dead Revolutionary War general requests. And so my marker got installed in less than a year. You have to draft the text, and that's probably the hardest part. Because again, you have to condense 12 to 14 lines of 45 spaces per line. It's like taking meat off the bone. You just don't want to do it because you're losing out on the full story. But they will condense it. I cheated and I added extra stuff and they caught it and took it out. So I did not get my way. You have to suggest a location for the marker. It has to be on a state highway by state law, although there are some exceptions. And this is the easiest part. Take it to your local library. I had 80 signatures in one week. I didn't know we had 80 citizens in my town. <laughs> So I would encourage you, if you know of a significant place in, our, in your community that's worthy of a marker, it doesn't cost you anything to, to put one forward other than your time and effort. 
Now, I told you I traveled with my wife, Kristen. She didn't go with me all the time, but my little buddy, Kobos, did. That's him right there. And uh, he also climbs the 4,000 footers with me. My wife has already done the 48, and I've done 32. Uh, he's in all the pictures. I'm not, because I'm usually out of breath. He's not. And I was doing a book presentation in Warner, and we stopped at the Foothills restaurant, which had this griddle cake. It's like this big. It was fantastic, and Kowas let me have some. So he's my travel companion. So this time I'd like to do is open it up to any questions you may have. Yes, sir. Since you're in Manchester, the Henry Wilson moniker, we have an elementary school named after him. Really? Yes, yes. And there's a plaque in there about him, and there's a little confusion because there was a Wilson school before there was a Henry Wilson school, mm -hmm. but the point is, I just thought I'd mention that. And I, I appreciate you telling me that because last week I did a presentation in Center Stratford and they said, well, you know, because he wasn't Henry Wilson when he lived here, it was Jeremiah Colbath. And they said, do you know that Jeremiah went to a Stratford Academy just down the road? I had no idea. Last night I was in Farmington. I'm like, is that true? Because that's where the marker is. like, yes, he did go to school there. And every time I go, I'm learning a new piece of information. And that's what I like about our state being so small because there's a lot of intertwined <laughs> history. But thank you very much for that one. Maybe someone would add something to that, you know, another type of marker, even if it's a Manchester Historic Association marker. Just to follow on, <laughs> yes, <sir. laughs> to follow on Henry Wilson, if you go in the west door of the State House, there is a plaque for uh, Vice President Henry Wilson mm -hmm. on the inside of that. It's a good sized plaque in there you could catch up on. And I think, you know, school children will see that, but they don't connect with that. And I don't know how many adults go in there that just, I think if I had my way, we wouldn't have fourth graders going to the state capitol. We'd have 11th graders and learning about state history before they vote. But that's just me. Any other questions? Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. A comment and a question. Yes, sir. Um, I give tours of the west side, so I always stop in front of the, the uh, America's Credit Union Museum. Mm -hmm. And with my students, I make them there's two errors in there. Two, uh, one is a typo and one is a grammatical error, so I make them take out those errors. In French or English? In French. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. oh you're tough. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, come and, on, this and, is for <laughs> yeah. And it is the pastor of St. Marie's who had Alphonse Desjardins, who is the founder of the first credit union in North America, mm -hmm. up in his, his hometown of Libby, across from. Quebec. He came down and he spoke about his credit union to the parishioners, and then they decided to found it. And if you go up to Quebec, there are Desjardins credit unions all over the place. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So they actually started with that. I I would right, say yeah. Desjardins, but obviously didn't say it correctly. Right. And the, the question is, because that marker is bilingual, have you run into any other markers that might be in another language besides that? Not on the state historical. That's the only one that has got another language. Now there's, I found typos. I there's there's terminology on markers that probably wouldn't get approved now. There is one marker that I will share that is incorrect, and it's only based on timing. And if you are familiar with, you go on 302 past the Omni Mount Washington Hotel, and where the train comes up from Conway, <coughs> it's now the Appalachian Mountain Center's Highland Center. There's a building there. The AMC has, and it used to be the Crawford House, mm -hmm. and that is the original home that the Crawfords had as their guest mm -hmm. house. And the sign is actually, um, I think the date on the sign is like 1978, and I'm sorry, the marker is 19, yeah, the marker is 1974, and it says there's three uh, three buildings, the current one having stood there since like the 1800s. The truth is, the marker was installed uh, right before the building burnt down. So there's actually the fourth building on site, which is now the Highland Center. But it, the way it reads, you would think that that beautiful building that's only less than 20 years old, it was built in the 1800s. It's just because the marker information hasn't been updated. Uh, but I don't think anyone ever catches that. Like, that's not that old. But it is inaccurate. But there are some typos and some signs. Yes, sir. Is, is there any uh, recognition of the German POW? Yes, in Stark. 
It is. So there's a marker right on Route 110, right in front of where the, uh, the POW camp was. Oh, great, thanks. And uh, I believe that state property, and I've heard stories of what they wanted to do with making it a park, but there are still, because I have a camp in Stark, and there are two segments, and they look like they might have been part of a fireplace or something. There's one that's really close in the woods to the marker, and then another one, you can only really see it in the winter, but there's a little American flag in there. But if you read the story called Stark Decency, yes. written about, see, I think it was, I forgot his first name, but his last name was Coop from Hanover. He was a Dartmouth teacher related to C. Everett Coop. I think it was his son, but yes. I don't, rem I don't yeah. remember. Yeah, Alan Coop. Yeah. Yes. yes. <clears throat> Excellent book to learn about how we and the Germans, they go along very well. That's why it's called Stark Decency. They actually had a re reunion in the 80s where some of the survivors came back. But to hear the stories about those who ran away and how they caught them, like driving down the road, the sheriff pulls around to get in, and the guy gets in, he brings them back because the German <laughs> escaped. But they, it was a great story, so I would highly encourage Stark Decency as a read. Yes. Any other questions? Wow, thank you. So I'd, I'd like to thank John for the invitation, and Christy as well. As John mentioned, he had bought four from the Webster House, and uh, I'm very appreciative of that. I know the Webster House is too. But I want to thank you all for coming out here today as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. You know, as much as an author loves your gazing attention, adulation, uh, this is the best part of an author talk is the book signing part. Uh, most publishers are very annoying in that they charge an uneven sum for books, $19.95, $21.95. Michael brilliantly has charged $20 per book. Either that or he has to bring him back on nickels with him every time he goes out. Okay, that's no fun. So he is happy to stay and sign books for you here. I'm going to put a chair in. Please Perfect. form an orderly line if you have exact change. That would be great. If you don't, we do have a gift shop out front. And we can make accommodations for you if you didn't bring your checkbook or $20 bills. Perfect. Thanks again, Michael Bruno. Um, I had a person who was a uh, fan of the book who said, you ought to come up with like a badge or a pin like this climbing the 4,000 footers. And I'm thinking, that's more work. I really don't want to do that. <laughs> but it made me start thinking about an idea. And the idea was to do something so people can advertise their, their love and interest in the markers. So she actually came to me and said, why don't you do a bumper sticker? So it, here's what I did. I created a bumper sticker, but I want to ex explain why I did it. Some people like bumper stickers, but I'm doing it as a fundraiser. And I can tell you that the city of Manchester is a big benefactor of this. The Copper Cannon Camp up in Bethlehem, they claim to be in Frank money, but they live in Bethlehem. Copper Cannon Camp is a, a summer camp for students who are underprivileged and underserved in the state of New Hampshire where they can attend camp for free in the summer. So what I'm doing is um, the, the, mark, the bumper stickers are $3 a piece, and all proceeds will go to the Copper Cannon Camp. So if you're interested in bumper stickers, three bucks. I have a separate little envelope for that. Uh, but the books are 20s, and so hopefully you'd be interested in both. Very good.